Well, welcome to another edition of the White Mountain Endurance Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Heron, and we are also joined today by Larson Ojala, who is coming off an epic push in the White Mountains. Uh, he just completed 161 miles and around 56,000 feet of climbing, uh, piecing together the entirety of the Appalachian Trail that goes through the White uh, through New Hampshire. Um, and it took you, I think, just over uh, three days and, and 73 hours and 37 minutes. How are the legs and mind feeling this morning, Larson? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Patrick. Hey, nice to be here. Um, yeah, I, they, they're, they're a little iffy. The mind is probably more foggy than the legs. Honestly, my, my right knee's a little blown up still. I've kind of had it looked at this morning, but it's, it's getting better. It's going to be a little bit of a rest to get that back. But yeah, the mind, I think, from all the sleep deprivation is definitely not 100% at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, geez, I can only imagine that. Uh, I mean, how many, how much sleep did you get over the effort? Were you able to take a couple cat naps on the trail or was, was there not much of that? Yeah, there was two times. I I felt I, I I crashed when I was dealing with like stomach issues really bad up through the night on the Prezi. I um I laid down right by the Lake of the Clouds hut. There was this mossy portion. I went in my bivy with my hat and gloves and puffy. I prepared for the Prezi at night. I knew it would be a little cooler and I took it. I think it was like 20 minutes there. I laid down for about okay. a half hour, but and then they, Connor Brown and Tyler Seppala were pacing me the second night through the Kinsman Ridge Trail, and they, they gave me 20 minutes on the ground. So I had two naps the first two nights. The third night, I planned on being done, but I ended up going through a third night. So, um, yeah, no sleep that night. And is this, this is, I, I imagine, the longest sort of time on feet, uh like that you that you've done before i know you've done some other pretty pretty long efforts but does this uh yeah surpass them as the longest yeah yeah this one <laughs> this was this was right by everything with vert miles and uh time on feet no doubt so this was yeah. a, this was all new to me you know the hallucinating and all that and boy i was i've never felt so out of my mind from something that didn't um, involved drugs, you know, from my past. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It wow. was a psychedelic. <laughs> yeah, it's one way, I guess, to experience it. Um, yeah, so I guess, like, sir, for some background, um, for those who don't know Larson, I feel like you have a history of these sort of epic pushes in the White Mountains, and you've become, yeah, sort of known for... Um, yeah, a bit of these these crazy challenges that you've embarked on. Um, some of the ones I'm familiar with are, I guess, the the triple Pemi, um, which sounds. I mean, one one Pemi is is rough, and that can take people a, a full day to complete. And you did, yeah, th three of them in a row, um, and pretty pretty quick too. I think what it took you over like a a, a day and eight hours or so, or um, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> something like that. Yeah, it was. And then I think it was a what 10 else? Hour. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, it all. Yeah. Done the the double traverse on the uh, presidential traverse, and I think you still yep. hold the the FKT for that in ten thirty nine, um, which is is bonkers. Uh, Lodge to Dodge. I know that's another one of your your big ones. Um, what else are we missing here? Yeah. Um, then the White Mountains 100 up there as well. I did that. Oh, yeah. Um, I actually did the Lodge to Dodge and the Triple Pemi and the White's 100 all in the same season, same summer. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was on a roll, I guess, that year. <laughs> and, yeah, so for those who don't know, what, what I guess is like your connection to the White's? What, yeah, when did that start? Did that start as a as a kid or more in recent years, um, what, yeah, just how were you first introduced to the White Mountains in New Hampshire? 
Well, I started, you know, hiking and running over here, but um, I'm in Adnock, but I, the, the white tall came a little later on. I, I had a friend, Brady, who was bringing me up to do these traverses, the Pemi Loop and the Prezi, and I was like, wow, this is hard, you know, just one-way trips. And, I mean, to me, I was in somewhat shape, too, and it was kind of difficult, you know, tough days, tough terrain, it just smack me around so yeah i didn't i started with the uh, new hampshire 48 and i was you know kind of just drawn by the mountains you know i i wanted to um you know do a, complete the new hampshire 48 and that's kind of where it all started and um and in that process i started dabbling with the ultra scene back here where i live you know in ringe where i've i've done some 50s and diff a lot of different ultra adventures over this way you know in the meantime of completing my new hampshire 48 but yeah so i guess i finished the 48 and that's where all the endurance started being introduced to my life and i decided to start trying it you know up there <laughs> yeah so what what year did you finish the the 48 uh that had to be back in 2019 or so 2018 okay. Yeah, probably 2018, if I had to remember right. I remember doing it one year, and, and uh, yeah, it was and like a few months. I was looking on your, your ultra sign-up. I think uh, you don't, even though you've done quite a few ultra efforts, you don't have much in terms of races specifically, no. but you have done the the Mid-State Massive, the 50-miler, and then actually Kilkenny Ridge 50-miler as well. Um, yeah. but it seems like, I think that was maybe 2020 and 2021. Um, yeah. and then, yeah, now, now you're, uh, I guess just doing the, the non-race, uh, but just e as equally or if not more, <laughs> I guess the, the races didn't have crazy enough stuff for you. So <laughs> you switched to that uh, direction. Yeah. But, I would love to race the jigger and whatnot, but I, you know, I think that's going to happen at some point, but, um, yeah, I don't, I, I think it would be just fun to be around other people and aid stations and not have to crew myself. I just, I'd have an aid station. I, I might like that route. So that's yeah, that's decent running and climbing it has it all. So I mean, and the turnaround that's mentally tough. So that kind of makes me want to do it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, I know. I was gonna yeah. say Jigger Johnson is a perfect perfect race for you. So we would definitely love to see you out there, and that would be yeah, that would be awesome um i think it would, it would yeah suit you pretty well so if not uh in the cards this year maybe next year we can yeah <laughs> make it's it happen. definitely in it's it's in my thoughts for next year for sure awesome um so yeah i guess to get sort of into the uh into the weeds with the the recent effort um i heard you describe it as sort of a white mountains hundred combined with the Dartmouth 50 which for anyone who knows those individual routes uh each of them yeah I mean White Mountains 100 is how many feet of climbing are over the White Mountains 100 it's um, a bit it's over 36,000 36 okay yeah, yeah. um yeah. And so I guess you've had a lot of familiarity with that section of, of the mm -hmm. trail, um, with the sort of Southern portion, the Dartmouth 50 was, were you also pretty, like, had you done a lot of recon on, on the route in the build up to this effort or, um, yeah. What did that look like going into it? Yeah. I had already covered all the trail. Um, I had okay. done like the Dartmouth 50 and then I had done the Mahusik Traverse that would add on the beginning. I think it was like 18 yeah. miles in the beginning. So I had done both that and I've done the Whites 100. So I was pretty familiar with most of it, but it still didn't like, as familiar as I was, I didn't remember it very well at night toward the end. Like <laughs> I still don't remember <laughs> the night. So <laughs> Yeah, it was all kind of like new. I, I didn't really know where I was anymore. I thought we were like repeating like the same <laughs> climbs and the same trail over and over and over again toward the end. That, 
sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> oh no, I'm back here. Yeah. Um, so when when did this idea, like vision to do this, come together? I know, from what I know, you had made a previous attempt last summer, but that was cut short just due to sort of bad uh, weather with like pretty hot and humid temperatures. Um, was last summer sort of the start of this this idea or has it existed in your mind for a while? Yeah, well, I mean, it didn't come up last summer. It's actually been in my mind since before I got into endurance. I wanted to um, I wanted to hike it and like stay at huts and camp and do it that way. I wasn't into I didn't know. <laughs> I honestly didn't know people could do this stuff. You know, I, I didn't know that was yeah. a thing where you could just keep keep going and you don't stop and um so my friend lance and i we talked about it at work and we were gonna you know see how fast we could do it and just fast pack it and camp and stay in huts when we could and do it that way because i you know i love new hampshire it's you know my home state so i'm like well like why not at least do the at through new hampshire just to do it through our own state you know and then someone said well you know no one's done it in one push and i i was into endurance by then so i said you know I'll, why don't we try that so i um i actually didn't really have the the kahunas to go after it right away so it took a <laughs> few years to build the confidence to go but you know that's what happens you just build confidence through you know one big effort to the next yep um do you want to share, yeah, I guess a little bit about like last year's experience and what you took away from that and um, how that sort of built into this year? Yeah, so I went out last, um, September 7th was the day. It was probably 95 okay. degrees. I was so nervous and I, you know, because of the heat, the heat alone made me nervous, much less the route. And I, you know, I was getting heat advisories on my phone and like all the red flags of why you shouldn't be out there attempting something like this. But I'm like, well, people run 100 milers in the heat all the time. Well, I don't do well in the heat. So I am. Um, I got cooked. I started, I think I made it to Pinkham Notch in like 13 hours. It's That has like 14,000 feet of climbing from the start to Pinkham. And um, I had, a, you know, Mike King, a friend of Christina's and myself, he was pacing me through there. And, uh, yeah, he was trying to encourage me on, and then I started puking from the heat, and, yeah, and then he kind of, you know, I guess co-signed my BS, and <laughs> it was a good, that was the right decision, I think, at the time, was yeah. to call it, you know, and um, this time didn't feel like I had any excuse to quit. I mean, I probably did, but I didn't, I didn't have the same red flags with the heat that that forecast had, so I just had to get it done, so, yeah, I laughed, <laughs> it, yeah, it it really uh, made me stubborn for this time. I'm like, I I feel like the more you DNF stuff, the more the easier it is to do it again. And so I'm like, I got to make it through this this time because I'm just gonna. What's gonna happen is just, this is just gonna become a thing where I DNF everything I do, and people aren't gonna want to pace me anymore. And I mean, these are just <laughs> the thoughts thoughts that are going through my head. Yeah. So I felt like everybody deserved they all they all had their week and planned out around me so i just figured i couldn't this time i couldn't quite you know i couldn't let a second failure take me out and break me so that was that's probably what i took away from last year is it kind of it made me a lot more stubborn this year to just keep going as hard as it was it was actually really difficult you know sometimes it looks like it was easy on strava but I don't do many write-ups, yep. so people never hear about all the misery, whereas, <laughs> you know, now they can come and listen to this, and they'll know that it wasn't just a piece of cake for me, you know? <laughs> yeah, did, when did it start? I mean, like you said, the the first several miles, they hit you right off the bat with a lot of climbing. Um, I guess from a physical well, physical and mental perspective, like where did it start to get challenging for you um, on the route? Okay, so um, I I felt like the Mahusik section through there was um, probably the the honeymoon phase. I was getting nice views. It was still pretty cool on this on this, yep. this latest. <laughs> yeah, it was cool out and nice views and 
kind of just feeling like feeling good about it and it started to heat up the second I got into the cats and heading up you know Mount Moriah rather and um I I you know my wife met me at the uh Rattle River Trailhead where the White's 100 starts and we um I already had a stash there but she met me and we you know restocked I changed shoes and um, headed right up uh, Mount Moriah, which is a long, you know, long climb up to there, about five and a, five miles or so, with uh, probably four, three or four, four thousand feet of climbing, I think. So yeah, it started to get real just heading up there. So getting hot, you know, it was humid in those trees. You know, the whole Moriah, Cats, and Carter range is, you know, very little exposure. It's all in like a tree line, and it seemed like the sun mm. was. The sun was just above me that whole stretch. So, <laughs> yeah, it took a lot out of me through there. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of my issues came from was that humidity through that stretch there. But, yeah, so that's that. it started to get real pretty pretty early on. Yeah. Wow. Um, in terms of you said your, your wife was meeting you out there, and I know you also had a number of pacers. Um be great to yeah hear a little bit of the logistics in terms of you know how often you were uh receiving aid or getting to drop bags um and also how much of it were you alone versus with pacers i'd be curious to yeah hear a bit about that okay um so i i had drops of so i did have a drop at route two another one my wife was meeting me at pinkham and then I had drops at Crawford, 93, and then a, a full crew that started at um, Beaver Brook at Musalak. But, um, yeah, so I, I, um, I did the first 60 miles alone about. I didn't want someone to be pushing me too hard in the beginning, so I yeah. went solo for about 60, 60 miles. So the, through the first night, um, I actually, this other Patrick, Patrick um, Hanalon, he met me out there, this Jake Aceto friend of mine told him to uh, come out and see me. So we, coming down the Wildcat Ridge Trail, I got a little company from him and another hut crew. And it was really cool to see the guys and, you know, their, the community, how inspired they are. And, you know, get to talk to somebody besides myself. I didn't see anybody at yeah. first. That, you know, that was like 40 miles in, I didn't see a soul, so... It was good to talk to some people and some people that knew me, you know, from I think Kilkenny Ridge Race is where he met me. We um chatted it up and then he we got down to the car. I resupplied and put my um fast pack on for the presidential at night with all my uh bivy and all my extra gear that I was gonna need, you know, through the night and on the Prezi. We restocked and, you know, I I headed up. Oh, that's good. There were the stomach started to go south already on that climb, which that climb is so brutal. It's just, you know, steep and very rocky. Uh, and just a gnarly climb, you know? Yeah. So and the sun's going down as I'm going up and the wind, I broke tree line, put, you know, put my windbreaker on and that's where the, uh, that's where the wind started blowing me off of rocks and, I started, you know, trying to, like, go from one rock to the next. Well, in the process of hopping that rock, I'm getting blown over from 40-mile-per-hour winds. And wow. It just it didn't seem possible. Like, I, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this one, you know. I'm puking over the edge of the trail and, um, you know, finally make it up to Madison and then, you know, head down to the hut. And that's where I um, restocked some water and seen it. A girl was coming in for the night. It was like 11 o'clock at night. I was, you know, already running like three hours behind schedule in my head. I just kind of had these rough numbers, and I knew I was slow. And I'm like, wow, well, this had better get better than this if I'm going to finish. I don't want to walk it out at 1.5 miles per hour, you know. And <laughs> so I left the hut after she kind of cheered me up told me I could do it I was going to crush it and you know just the girl hiking was kind of cool to just get some encouragement that late at night from someone you mm -hmm. know she's trying to feed me her Oreos and I'm <laughs> sorry I can't take those they're just not going to work on my stomach and 
Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, it, it was a rough night. It was pretty rough. I got to Washington. I remember, like, there was a fork in the trail. You know, you go up to Washington on the AT or go straight. And every bit of me wanted to just go straight and cut Washington off. And I'm like, I can't do that because then if things get better, I'm going to have to come back and get Washington, you know, otherwise I yeah. won't have the whole AT. <laughs> so <laughs> that's just where my mind was mentally, like where that's how close I was to bailing out of there. So, yeah, I got up, touched the sign, kept it going, got down to the hut. And that's where I, I said, well, I'm going to give myself, you know, one more chance to like lay down, get a little bit of sleep and like reset this nasty stomach. So I, I did that. I pulled out a bivy, which they do, those do work really well. I didn't realize it till the other night how, how much those bivies reflect heat. And I put on all mm -hmm. my layers and hopped in, you know. So yeah, yeah, I, I took a quick nap and then I started getting text messages from my first crew, Clark Plummer and Connor Brown, my first two pacers, they said, you know, we're coming to get you. We're on our way up, you know, or, you know, they're on the, they were on the drive up to the whites and they, um, they said, we, we, you know, we'll bring you a ginger ale and we're going to, you you got this, you know, and that's where, that's where it's so handy to have people in the community to support you because otherwise, I don't know, you know, I might have not finished, so. I, I got to give a lot of credit to people that like that, you know, they'll come out and you know, in the middle of the night and pick you up, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'm sure they all, regardless of whether you were to finish or not, we're, we're glad to be part of the experience. I think just sharing that with someone is, I mean, I know like those are some of the best memories I have out on the trail are with other people. Um, even if you're suffering and feeling <laughs> horrible, <laughs> just, yeah, being able to, you know, ha have other people to know what you went through and to also go through it with you. Um, so yeah, I, I like that you did it in this style where you had, you know, pacers and support throughout. Um, I'm sure, yeah, it just makes, I don't know, like, yeah, you just have different memories that come out of it than if you were to do the whole thing yourself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no doubt. I mean, like if I were to do it myself, I know I would need probably seven, eight hours of sleep to pull it off by myself. I, I would imagine. I don't think that um, I would mentally be able to follow the trail too well anymore if I didn't have them. But having them to follow, it made it a lot easier, you know, made made me realize, like, yeah, pacers are needed. I know you can, I can run a hundred miler probably without pacers, you know, on a well-known course, but I'm not going to be going through this terrain without them for this long. It's just such, su such slow terrain up through the AT on the whites with the rocks and descents and ascents, so. Yeah, no, I am too. I am. Everybody had fun. It seemed like most of them did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I might have been a little too slow for them at times, but. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Um, did you have going into it like splits or predictions for different sections or were you sort of more just thinking of it big picture? It'll take me approximately this long or yeah. How much did you break it down ahead of time um, in your mind? Well, I I did at first. The last year I had splits, and I I truly think they were they were way too fast. I had them at, you know, I think three miles per hour through the entire thing, which I was just an average by the time I got out. I mean, some the White Mountain stuff was slower. It was more like two point eight on my sheet, but um, I think uh, I kind of threw those out the window and added an hour to each section that from last year's splits and then kind of went from, from that, but I didn't really go by them very much after my stomach kind of blew up. I, I had this finishing time of around 60 to 63 hours in my head. Okay. And, um, so yeah, I was thinking that would be a time I could do. And when all these problems started, I'm like, well, you know, just finish and don't, you know, so I, that's kind of what happened. You know, I kind of, I was, I still did, you know, some of these sections I we did decent time in, but, um, I'm just happy that I, you know, finished at this point and I, um, 
I'm not beating myself up too much about it. Just because this is my first one, you know, going this, this distance with this much vert. So I just, um, giving the terrain and the white mountains being what they are, it's so unforgiving that I kind of just, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm just happy I made it through and, you know, it's as consistent as I was the whole time. So that's a takeaway mm -hmm. for that. So I'm, and it hasn't been done before, so to my knowledge, <laughs> I'm like, well, I might as well lead the way. I know there's be some other ones at some point, but yeah. Were any of your your uh, pacers inspired to maybe take it on themselves, or have you heard yet from anyone in the community who wants to follow in your footsteps? Um, I actually, yeah, there was someone on my Instagram that had commented that they want to try it later this summer. Um, I haven't responded. She's a friend of mine, but, and then, um, okay. I, I, they, most of them all went with the whites 100, the Pacers, they seem, that's a big, you know, there's a few of them that are going to be going after it soon, you know? So, okay. Yeah. That that's, you know, probably the place to start really for me. I yep. <laughs> to build confidence, you know, I mean, in my mind, I like to think of it as a lodge to dodge is a perfect, that's a perfect, um, step up from a hut traverse and then after the lodge to dodge you do a you know you do a white's 100 and that's you know like mike okay. connelly michael connelly a friend of mine he's a he's going after it soon and he has done a pemidential i paced him on that he's done a lodge to dodge i paced him on that now he wants this one so he's just a phenomenal guy great athlete and you know him and uh him and, uh, and for those who for those who don't know like so the hut traverse that's 50 ish miles uh lodge to dodge is what around 70 or 75 yeah. miles it's, it's, it's 70 yep yeah. 70 okay yeah. and that connects all all eight of the huts um yeah. of the amc huts um which which one do you start and where do you finish um well, the, you know, the hut traverse, you start in Lonesome Lake, or that's where I would start, but, and head over to, yeah. the, you know, the, the Carter Notch. But the Lodge to Dodge actually starts at the Musalak Ravine Lodge over in, um, you know, Musalaki and Woodstock. And uh, that goes up Musalak, comes down the Beaver Brook Trail, and heads into the uh, Kinsman Ridge Trail over Mount Wolf and do a... Uh, you know, down in there, it's a very muddy, you know, nasty stretch, and then comes up, up over the Kinsmans, down to the Lonesome Lake hut, where you start your hut traverse, then you end that at, you end the hut traverse, and then you finish it off with a climb out of the Carter Notch, up the Wildcat, grab all the Wildcats, and come down the uh, Wildcat Ridge Trail to the Joe Dodge Lodge, so it's a 27,000 feet of vert, in 70 miles so it's a uh it's a nice route i i love the route i think i'm going to go back out and try to do it faster someday just because of the issues we had back when we did it but yeah i i i let if someone tells me they're going for a lodge to dodge i get excited it's just one of them routes yeah. you know <laughs> i think it's a great it's a great way to step up in the whites from a hut traverse so that was actually and when made you by, when you had done that, you had taken a, I think a, a day and seven hours. I think is your your time yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. It was like thirty two hours, and I had a friend, one of my good friends, with me, and he had some issues, and it was kind of another rough go for me too, with some stomach problems through the prezi. But it, it can go under twenty four with me, I believe. Um, I just that's kind of what I'd like to do try to go sub 24 with it but nice <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> yeah I, Drummond was asked me about unfinished business and I kind of didn't mention it to him but I would like to try you know and see see what I get a little more respectable time on it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I well I think it's pretty respectable right now but that would be awesome sub 24 yeah. um so yeah you've mentioned a couple times like stomach issues on on this 
uh, most recent effort as well as prior ones. What is, is that a common occurrence for you? And what is like, what is your general fueling hydration strategy for these longer efforts? Yeah, I think the stomach issues kind of, those come from a lot of gels and humid weather. Um, I've done a lot of like big stuff like the triple Pemi in the White Mountains 100. I had, you know, pretty fast pace going for them and even like the double Prezi and it was all cool days or low humidity and I've never had a problem. But the days where it's, you know, humid and I'm sucking in humidity and those are the days I start puking on. So I try to like mix between gels and then real food. I use Morton gels and cyst gels as well as this pro play hydration. I mix in, in most of my electrolytes in my water just to kind of help get them down and not overdo yeah. the electrolytes, you know, um, like bacon. I'll bring that out, cook it up, wrap it up. It's easy to chew on and gives me salts and fats that that helps. Um, and obviously soup. I'll, if I have a crew, I'll I'll try to get some sort of soup at later stages of an event where you know the gels maybe aren't tasting so well anymore. You know you can eat yeah. that. But yeah, just as little junk as possible. I don't like eating too much candy and gels and cokes the whole time. You know, seltzer waters <laughs> are good. <laughs> but I do try you have to keep... like a goal? per hour or are you more just going by feel in terms of like how much you're eating and drinking? Um, if, if my stomach's rock solid and then, you know, I'm not dealing, let's say this is one of the days that I don't have any problems. I usually keep a steady drip. I just go every 15 minutes with something and just keep it steady and shoot for about 300 calories an hour. You know, I'm a, okay. I eat quite a bit until the stomach's gone and then if it does go, then like this one here, I, I think I went 25 miles with just my electrolytes and one bag of potato chips I had stuffed into my pack to try to wow. burst back my stomach. So, yeah, I was probably cannibalizing myself as I, <laughs> as I went through that section. But <laughs> yeah, it felt good to eat again. Um, you know, once I did, it's funny how eventually sometimes you battle it long enough your stomach does recover and it sure yeah. did on this one so oh yeah that's part of the i don't know i feel like the draw with with this really long stuff is you know there's enough room or enough time that things can can turn around so if things do go south you know they 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 don't well hopefully they don't continue to go south usually you can sort of right the ship um, and yeah, I feel like just playing around with the variables, like there's, there's always room to, you know, make things go better and, and all that. Right. Exactly. So that's, that's the thing is, you know, even if you're not like eating anything, like I would chew up a piece of beef jerky and then just, you know, try not to <laughs> just use that, like just a little bit. And even if I couldn't swallow it, at least I was getting salt and different stuff in, into my system, you know? And yeah. that was in sodium is one way, one way for me to start nursing it back anyway, you know? And yeah, like, like you said, if this was an effort, if I was going for like a time goal and that was what I was going for, maybe, you know, that'd be time to call it if your stomach blows up and you're like, okay, well, this is not going to happen. What's the point in killing yourself out there if you can't do it, you know, that day? <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, there is a point, a time and a place for it. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'd love, I well, yeah, I'd love to, I guess, talk a bit about some of the rest of your uh, sort of background in life. But I guess final questions on, on this most recent effort are what did it feel like when, yeah, after 73 hours you, you crossed that, uh, unofficial finish line and then how how soon ha uh until you thought maybe because it sounds like this is potentially in your head maybe doing it another time <laughs> <laughs> yeah um let's see here i uh yeah it felt awesome to finish i was um i was you know bonking bonking through the woods all night i didn't know what was happening and then i kind of got daylight out and 
like, well, you know, kind of coming out of that trip, you know, I felt like I was hallucinating all night. And we come down, you know, you come out of the woods up in Hanover and you're, um, you see the big ball fields down below and it's a neat little town, you know, it's, you come a lo- covered a long ways. So you're like 160 miles in at that point where you take a right at the co-op and it has little, you know, Appalachian Trail, north and south, things on the sidewalk painted and you just follow those down and I couldn't run anymore at all at the end and my knee was so shot and I was just kind of limping it out and, you know, power walking down and, yeah, that's where I, you know, seen the bridge and my family, you know, on the bridge and Cameron, who was still crewed me through the night from Musilock and, you know, my daughter comes running down the bridge to sit, to meet me, you know, she's only one and a half and, yeah, that was really cool to, you know, pick her up and, you know, touch the granite post where it said New Hampshire to Vermont and, yeah, a lot of emotions going through my mind, you know, I felt like, uh, I just, I felt pretty broken, I guess, from the pain on my knee yeah. for, you know, 65 miles, so it was this big tough guy that people sometimes think I am, I'm not that strong, you know, I, <laughs> mentally it was just getting emotional and wanting to cry, and yeah, it was kind of cool, I mean, you definitely gives you a it's rewarding, you know, to to suffer through something like that is, you know, especially when it doesn't go your way, when you do finish. It does come to an end at some point. Out there, you you know, you think it's never going to end. You're like, this is just hell, you know. I'm going to be like in, in this forever. But three days feels like a lot longer than three days when you're battling. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, here we are talking about it now and... <laughs> at least that part of the suffering's over. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. We'll have to. I have a few other, you know, mind. I have a few other things in my mind right now. I mean, maybe of doing instead of repeating this for now. I'd probably let this sit for a while. But yeah, um, yeah. I I I'm that kind of person that you know. If I start getting a little bored and I'm looking for something to do, I'm gonna need a, you know. It, this is my hobby, so as long as I'm not killing myself with it every year, I, you know, most likely it'll come back up again. I just have, you know, a few other things I'd like to do instead, you know, of distance. And we're looking at, okay. I'm already mapping out Maine and, you know, that side. I'm like, well, maybe this is how I'm going to through hike the AT. Just do it, section hike it by state. You yeah. Know? <laughs> so. <laughs> so, yeah, what, so... Let's hear some of those other other things. So you're thinking of piecing together the whole AT in Maine. Is that that's one yeah, of the ones on your radar? Or um, it wasn't until I pulled out my maps the other day and just started playing with my map. And usually that gets dangerous. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I started linking it up already. So um, I'm not trying to chase the high or whatever. I just I want to. I'd like to try do something different than repeating the same thing and, you know, maybe just move on for now. But yeah, that's, that looks like a 260 mile stretch on my Gaia with about 61,000 feet of climbing. So almost the same vert profile as the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And, but it's a lot much more spread out. So yeah, maybe I'd have to learn how to run a little more. (laughs) Hmm. (laughs) <laughs> get that done yeah. it would be cool to be on runnable terrain for some of it instead of i know maine's rough but i heard like my buddy connor knows he hiked the at and there's they're not it's not all like the white mountains the whole way so yeah so that would be cool do you think you would do that one finishing at katahdin or would you start at katahdin and and come to new hampshire I would probably go up to Katahdin. It seems like it would be cool to okay. finish there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Start right where I started <laughs> and went through New Hampshire. Yeah. This one, this one would require a little more sleep since it would be, you know, 260-ish miles. So, but I might have to figure out how to work on my knees too just so I can handle a little bit more of this mileage and descending, you know. But the vert profile is a little more spread out, so. I'm not sure if it would beat me up quite as quick as it did on this, the, you know, 
yeah. a lot of people with this white mountain stuff. But yeah. Do you take any specific approach like training wise? What is I guess like yeah, what what is do you structure your training much or is it more just these big adventures sort of pieced together that <laughs> get you mm -hmm. to the next one? What yeah, what what's yeah. training look like for you? Well, you hit you hit it both, you know, because, you know, now that it, in the summer, once I'm recovering from one thing, I usually kind of ride off the, the last efforts, you know, base fitness. But um, I get slow on work in the winter, so I put together some 70-mile vertical weeks, you know, on Monadnock this winter. And then leading up probably a month and a half before I, I, I do – I try to get some 90 mile weeks in on the mountain here on Monadnock and with probably 70 of those being on Monadnock and then I do a lot of like some trail running by my house and I have a Stairmaster so I throw on the weighted vest and simulate the climbs you know the I try to go about 5,000 feet workouts on the Stairmaster just to uh kind of get the feel for climbing up to say Mount Moriah or whatever over and over try to get climbing endurance down so my legs can handle the climbs but yeah that's about it it's it's structured but with my job I always tell people concrete is my coach you know it kind of tells me <laughs> when I'm gonna do what and where you know but yeah yeah it even gives me training at work you know with cardio and whatnot so that's part of my training, really. Yeah, what is what does your job look like? From what I know, you own a a concrete business. Um, have you? How long have you been doing that? And what's like an average day look like for you? Um, well, yeah, I started my own business about you know three and a half years ago, but which gives me a little more time when I want the time to do what I need to do. But it, uh, yeah, it's um, it's a kind of a, a messy job. Uh, you you could put it on the um, dirty jobs on with micro or whatever that show is <laughs> called. Yeah, it's a uh, it's yeah. rugged work. You know, you're out in the heat and it's cardio wise. You know, raking it out and screeding it off and finishing it. You know, every aspect of it is somewhat of you know it's physical for sure. But it's also fun. You know, the camaraderie and the guys and everybody seems to be like a gym rat or into running or some sort of the ones who last in it are usually people who take care of themselves and uh, yeah. don't do drugs and alcohol and the ones that do that they're shot by the time they're you know 40 so yeah it is a rugged job you you're not going to want to do it when you're uh, let's see 55 to 65 years old you want to be done by then but it's uh it's all I really have known. I can do other stuff, but like construction in my family, that's, you know, we, that's how we, um, that's how we've made our living, you know, with the area yeah. that I'm from, you know, so it's, it's a good job for, you know, it definitely makes you hard, hard, you know, toughens you up. There's a lot of long nights finishing the concrete and early mornings waking up to pour more, you know, <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of uh, similarities to to ultra running. <laughs> yeah, it does have a lot. That's one thing. I I think it does help. I, it does help with my training. So. Yeah, that's, my, um, that's what I do. One of the I feel like common. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you were you were saying this sort of like family business for you, and I. Um, yeah, I feel like one of the common things I see just on, you know, your social media and Strava is like, um, how much family is a part of your world, like the importance of, of family for you with both your wife, it, you know, I, I know she's, uh, a strong runner in her own right. And you get to share some adventures and runs together. And also with your kids who, you know, although they're pretty young, you seem to, go on a lot of hikes with them and get them outdoors. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, I guess, just hear you speak to how, yeah, just the, the role like your family plays in, in, in your running and, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so that's, that's kind of how this works. If you get married and you have kids, you, you got to find a wife that's into the same hobby. 
<laughs> so it really does work <laughs> out. I mean, <laughs> she gets it, I get it. So like, if I'm at the mountain training, I leave. She she switches with me, and I take the kids from the mountain, and then she goes and does her training. So that's kind of how we operate. And then she'll do her all trubby or her whatever she's up to few weeks before I do mine and we try to like kind of recover together or yeah so we involve the kids at least once a week go for hikes with them um she uh she probably um doesn't do quite as much training as I do because I kind of do the bigger stuff so I tend to hog a little more of the time (laughs) but but yeah no that works (laughs) that works out good um we kind of you know Travis and his brother Walter are my wife's brothers, so I kind of like inspired them to get into running, and now here they are. Um, they're all a very fit group of family, you know. So they, uh, yeah, they, it's a, it's definitely a um, part of our life now. I never thought I'd see the day I'd be running on mountains. I like, you know, when I was doing my 48, we did Mount Jefferson, and you know. <laughs> I had this big hiker pack on and all these boots and I, I never, you know, imagined yeah. that we'd get into this stuff, you know. Now now we got her running up and down Manadnock 15 times, you know. So it's like, wow, uh, yeah, <laughs> it kind of got out of hand a little bit, you know. Maybe it's just the personality. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great that, yeah, you understand each other and, and where, yeah, I think that helps a lot just to have the same kind of the same kind of crazy i guess (laughs) yeah no it's kind of a crazy world we live in with the with this hobby with this what we all do is it's not um it's funny how unnormal it really is you know i feel like everybody does endurance but you go out in the world and talk to people on the job site and how many of them are familiar with that there's not a whole lot of people you know that are going to go do a hundred mile race (laughs) (laughs) so yeah, like Drummond said uh, the other night on the podcast, we were talking, and he called it this kind of this crazy, cool little click we all have, you know? <laughs> it's not as big as you think. Yeah, no, it is It is, it is funny because when you are, yeah, I mean, m- for me, like, I'm running with friends, or I'm going to races, or going to other, like, related events, and so you're just constantly in that sort of bubble, and then when you go to like social occasions outside of that bubble, it does feel you're like, oh wow, okay, this is <laughs> this is a weird thing, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's sort of a world within a world, and um, yeah. it's cool that we can share it with each other. Um, yeah, they don't understand. Nobody gets why you do it, and like, I don't think they realize. I don't really know why I do it fully. I was wondering that on this latest debacle I got myself into the other night. Well, I'm yeah. trying to keep going, you know. <laughs> what am I doing out here? And I guess I was pretty comical, but it just did not make sense why I was out there and what I was doing out there anymore. Like the why was gone. Like I didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't get it. You know, I'm like told my pacers, I'm like, I just don't understand why I'm out here. I'm sure I will some other day, but right now I just. I just don't yeah. understand what I'm doing out here still, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes that's part of the, part of the why is like figuring out your why. I feel like as exactly. silly as that sounds, um, <laughs> I think it's yeah. a way to like learn more about ourselves and uh, yeah, just like, yeah, I don't know. There's so many life lessons that you take away from running and as, as, yeah, and there's lots of unknowns to it as well. So just like just like life. So yeah. Well, just think, Patrick. Just think how fun your life would be if you didn't run, or you didn't <laughs> bike. You know, like you. What would you do yeah. with your time? Like your extra time. I I would be bored out of my tree. You know. So I'm an extreme <laughs> guy. I I used to skydive until it kind of got a little too sketchy for me over there. But yeah there's a there's a reason why i do it and it has a lot to do with my past as well that the hurt of running an ultra or destroying myself out there is it 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 does you know i'm recovering drug addict and alcoholic so i um you know i kind of 
pick this up like five years into my sobriety or four year four years into my sobriety and it has helped with that as well so mm -hmm. i'm definitely a very grateful person today and i just try to keep the gratitude up so i can you know maybe help inspire others to that there is a better life you know i uh i am um, you know coming up on 10 years this fall lord willing and it's been a it's kind of been like a neat little hobby to help me um to help me cope with the all the extra energy and subject matter that we have there you know yeah um yeah somehow yeah it it does it does help with that and i've noticed that a lot with the endurance community there's I'm not quite the only one out there, you know, <laughs> in this sport that has kind of picked it up in the absence of what they did before, you know, so. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah cool. well, congratulations, man, on, yeah, um, almost 10 years. That's, that's awesome. And, um, yeah, I know I've, like you said, there is like a, I think a strong connection between the recovery community and the running community um and for for good reason and i think like yeah sometimes it's maybe finding like you said sort of the a way to replace you know a, a replacement in some regard for like the addiction but um also i think it's much more than that where they're like the community that you find through running is like really powerful and plays a huge role in like I think sobriety and um yeah I, I I don't know I I I think sometimes people simplify it into just oh it's replacing one thing with another but um I think it's a whole lot more than that yeah for sure and um like I I still go to you know rehabs and share and speak with people and go to meetings every week so it's it's not my whole piece of the puzzle but it's definitely a big part of it you know I uh I try to give back because there's a lot of people that were there for me, you know, when I was going through that, you know. So, yeah, it's it has been a great um, release for me to feel free again, you know, give me some adrenaline as well. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Well, yeah, this has been a, a great conversation and I feel like we've covered all sorts of stuff and uh i i wish uh i wish we were on the trail chatting instead of here here on our computers but <laughs> yeah yeah if we <laughs> had something time on the I'll trail have to, yeah i'll have to join you for one of your next next big endeavors i i would definitely love to uh crew or pace or any of that fun stuff so that'd be awesome um, yeah. yeah definitely you'll you'll have to keep me in the loop with what's next but i love yeah. the sound of the main at um, yeah that would be that'd be really fun to me um, i think it's the next yeah, step yeah. in mileage too you know so yep <laughs> <right>. <laughs> if you can make it 160 miles why can't you make it 260 <laughs> you know i know but, yeah are There's anything i'm curious curious in terms of yeah talking about these next steps up like does the vermont long trail uh interest you something something like that um, i know that's some less of a or more of a, a common route i feel like you're into creating your own routes sometimes but yeah where is the long trail in your mind well the long trail right now the only thing that interests me in the long trail is going out to pace with will peterson when he goes for it okay so yeah i i'm gonna leave that to him for now <laughs> but i <laughs> yeah. am excited he's he's going out and in august i believe so i okay. would love to go out and crew or pace you know pace him for for a while there maybe toward the end where i live a little more on the southern side of the state you know so yeah, yeah the, that that interests me i mean the diatisma comes to mind too but i um i, I don't know i kind of like this idea of get covering the at through new england state by state might be a cool project you know it's just you have yeah. to learn not to burn yourself out and do what you can handle and not you, you we want to be doing this sport for a while so i i gotta be careful i don't get go on a rampage too much but <laughs> yeah um 
especially with the unforgiving New England terrain. It's not like I'm a West Coast 200 miler here, you know. Yeah. So yeah, we got to be careful there. But yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess the the uh, the goals are never ending. <laughs> There's always something next that comes to my mind pretty quick. Yeah. So, yeah. Is it usually always like go longer, go go farther, um, or do you have goals in the the other direction as well? Are you interested in any shorter efforts or or faster um, um, routes? I would I would love to like just race Chicago. It sounds so fun, you know. Yeah. Like something like that would 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 be awesome. I mean, I. If I wasn't into this, like, I would never want to try it now with what I have on my legs now. But, I mean, I might come <laughs> watch Travis there or so. But, you know, my wife and I are always talking about racing each other up to Cog and, you know, yeah. during the race. So that'd be fun as long <laughs> as she didn't beat me too too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, one yeah. year she can be on the train and you can be cheering her on, and then the next year you can swap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be fun. So now that they have the round trip, it sounds pretty cool. Go up and yeah, turn around and run back down. Yeah, the round trip is gonna be wild. I'll be very yeah. So we've got that on tab for Sunday morning, and that'll be oh man. Well, yeah, I have no, I have no idea what. I mean, I've no, yeah, I'm not sure what to expect on the downhill, but it'll be pretty cool to see how quickly people come down. <laughs> I mean, it's oh. like that's the dangerous part because you can go so fast, but it's sort of an uncontrolled <laughs> fall going down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, that's I I rip around Monadnock a little bit, and like there's this other route on Monadnock I did as a training run this year. I might try again, but. It's all six of those main trailheads, and I do them, okay. you know, I, I'd like to try to do that faster than I did this, this year. I PR'd it, but I think it could be like eight hours or less. I'd like to try that again. I mean, obviously, another, I've done two 24-hour pushes on Monadnock. That might be something that sticks with me for a while. I might try another time and try to get, you know, yeah. 19, 19 summits and sub-24 there. Um yeah, there's there's a lot of others. Like it's funny these 24-hour projects seem small to me now. If I'm thinking <laughs> of multi-day stuff that you don't sleep, but I don't. Know, I think the running high. Just the longer you go, the bigger it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it does feel good to be fast too. I mean, you've done it all. You know the. You know it. It, it does feel good to just rip along for a few hours and call it a day too. You know, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I went out to the yeah, penny loop. Yeah, it's all, all and... relative, I guess. Yeah, it's always like, that's what I always say to people when they're like, oh, 100 miles, that's so far. And it's like, well, <laughs> it is really far. And at the same time, it's not that far. <laughs> no, <laughs> it doesn't become yeah. that far when you start looking at Coca Dona 250 and all these other <laughs> adventures, yep. you know, but. <laughs> Yeah, you just it. Some are for other. Some are um, meant for different people. You know, I don't know. I like to be diverse with my running and hiking and all that. But I kind of feel like I'm a little more of a power hiker in the mountains than I am a runner. But I'm definitely not a road runner. So <laughs> I don't know what to call me. <laughs> yeah. I guess I don't know what I am. Well, yeah. There's plenty of time to find out. I guess. Yeah, um, Lord willing, for sure. Awesome. Well, yeah, this has been a pleasure chatting, Larson. Um, and I guess, yeah, if people want to stay up to date on your adventures, probably what Strava is the best place or Instagram or where can people follow along? Yeah, I'm on Strava and I'm on Instagram, Larson Odula. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I'd like to, um, Patrick, I'd just like to thank my crew and um, Pacers. Yeah, out there. absolutely. So yeah, um, Clark Plummer and Connor Brown, they picked me up on the um, up on Mount Crawford and brought me all the way across the Pemi. Uh, Connor actually kept going and did all the way to Glencliff, I believe. Where um, nice. yeah, he had a good stretch there. And, <laughs> you know, Tyler Seppla hopped on at Lafayette and he paced me up over to Glencliff. Uh, let's see here. Michael Connolly, my sis sister Mariah, my wife Sarita, 
they they grabbed me from um, from uh, Beaver Brook and they did a 20 mile stretch and then I had Jason Emery and Harrison Laflem and uh, they came for, for the final stretch all the way to the end with Michael Connolly as well so they were awesome fit very fit group my friend Brady he came out and you know just seeing a new face on trail for even a few miles he shared some miles by smarts and then Riley Plord and Cameron Call they both crewed me um Cameron has crewed me in the past and they did an amazing job okay. so yeah they she, she um she went all night actually to the end Riley had to take off but yeah I don't think there was anybody else that I can think of I'm kind of fogged out still, but yeah, <laughs> they fair. all did awesome, and it's a team sport, so I just want them to know that they're appreciated, and you know, maybe we can get out on the next one and help them on something soon. That's awesome, yeah, no, I love how, like, like we were saying earlier, it's, I think running, you know, it can be a solo endeavor but oftentimes it's it's something that we can include a lot of our friends and family and there's you know there there there's a role for everyone whether it's uh crewing pacing just even just the support from afar knowing there's other people cheering you on back home i think it it goes a long way and uh sort of inspiring and giving you yeah reason to keep going so I think that's awesome. Oh, for sure. Like, you know, I've I got text messages from like Philip Karsha and um, Jake Aceto and Mike King, you know, and Andrew Drummond. They were messaging me and just, you know, it seemed like at, at the end of each section where I was going downhill to where somewhere I could bail, I was getting a bunch of messages on my inReach. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> oh, woohoo, you're doing so good, you know. And Travis, nice. and Travis gave me some good props before I left, you know, some – he had a lot of confidence and more confidence in me than I did myself. So, yeah, it is a team. It doesn't matter even if you're not there, you know, just knowing that the community's behind you and all that. So, yeah, very grateful for all that. Great. Well, um, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll close out this episode by yeah, great, great chatting. And I hope you uh, get plenty of, of rest and recovery in the next few few days and weeks um and yeah hope to uh see you on the trail in the the near future <laughs> yeah patrick it's been awesome talking to you i knew it'd be a good time <laughs> for sure yeah awesome well thank you so much larson you bet man <laughs>